Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, live stream and panel for the Academic Arts and Artistic Academia, which is born out of the blog posts that were compiled for the blog series uh, last year with Nish uh, called uh, um, Art-Based Research in the Anthropocene. So this is Amrita Dasgupta who had edited the series and I introduced to you myself. Uh, I am a final year PhD student at SOAS and I also teach at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And the project was born out of my own research methods that I use, the artistic research methods that I use uh, in my PhD project where I interact with uh, sex workers and because it is a very traumatic experience for them to undergo an interview, they paint their life and their experience in relation to uh, the keywords provided to them and come back to describe what they have drawn. So today we have with us um, uh, the uh, people from Niche. So I would invite uh, Nuala as well as Jessica if I'm missing someone, please do jump in and let me know to introduce themselves. And then we'll move forward to introducing the panel and talking with the panelists. Sure, I'll go first. Um, I'm Jessica DeWitt, and I am one of the uh, co-editor-in-chiefs of the Network in Canadian History and Environment, as well as the social media editor. And I am the person behind the screen of many niche things. Um, yeah. And I'm an environmental historian. Nula, you go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is very exciting, this first panel we're having. Um, I am the um, niche uh, scholars on, on the committee, and um, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at New York University. Uh, where I work on Madagascar and conservation law. And uh, I'm going to be uh, curating the uh, chat box for any questions that you know, comments you have. So please put them in there um, and I will collate them for later on after the panelists. So great to be here. Back to you, Amrita. Thank you both. And now I introduce to you our first two panelists while we wait for the other two to join. So we have with us Nick Coing and Ellen Bergen, who had uh, worked on a, a brilliant uh, blog post uh, for the series. And they had worked on Place T. Uh, if I pronounce it wrong, please do jump in and correct me. Uh, Place to Scene, Wood Trip Rich. So now I would move forward to them. I would I would like to introduce them. So Ellen Bergen, uh, pronounced they them, is a geography MS student in the University of Idaho tree ring, uh, ring, uh, tree ring lab, focusing on dendroclimatology, forest and peatland ecology, and their connections with queer cre creative geographies. Uh, Nick Coing, Pranand Edem is a geography PhD student in the University of Idaho Tree Ring Lab, exploring the intersections between dendrochronology, critical physical geography, and social sciences. Specifically, Nick has been exploring the medium of printmaking as a tool of rendering tree rings visuals. So I welcome you both, and I look forward to, you know, talking about your research. So if uh, Nick and Ellen uh, Y'all could uh, tell us more about your, you know, how you came to do this kind of research. Why were you interested in it? Cool. Yeah, I guess I can start off. Um, uh, so I came to University of Idaho with uh, funding to do a um, research project with uh, in partnership with Louisiana State University. And as part of like the most recent installment of this ongoing project focused on, uh, on um, an underwater forest that was discovered off the coast of Alabama after uh, almost a decade after Hurricane Ivan um, came through and kind of scoured the ocean floor. And uh, um, the backstory then was that a uh, local fisherman had noticed just really high, like anonymously high fish activity in the area um, and divers were sent down and they ended up discovering uh, you know dozens of tree stumps that were suddenly like out like 
rising out of the sea floor uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So as um, so then like the years of research that have been going on with this project since then, both in understanding the like, you know, the bathymetry of, of the region, uh, the sedimentology, um, understanding this like paleo-coastal ecosystem that once existed here. Uh, they sent me um, as part of this like next part of the project, a ton of wood. Uh, so wood that was pulled up both in forms of logs, uh, cut off from stumps, and also wood that was collected from sediment cores that were taken in the area. Uh, so I showed up and this is literally, I think one of the first things that I touched in the tree ring lab, but it was a big log. So this is the actual, actual log. <laughs> so oh, wow. several of these. Um, yeah, so this is an actual log from the underwater forest. Um, I wish that you could smell it because it does smell like uh, it has been underwater for 75,000 years. Um, yeah. Uh, and so my, like, kind of my, my task as being part of this research project was to uh, take really thin sections of the wood um, and put them onto slides so they look like this, and then look at them underneath the microscope and then identify uh, the tree species um, from the cell, from like the actual histology or the cell anatomy of these trees. Uh, and the first time that I managed to like get a thin section uh, from, you know, something, so it looks like this, and you just take, use a tool called a microtome, you just take a really thin slice off the top and put it, and like once I was looking at it underneath the microscope, I was like, this looks just like a lace knit like a, a, like a, if you were to take uh if you were just to like do knitting and do a style of knitting um that has like a really like lacy pattern with lots of holes um much more stretched out I was like this looks just like if you were to do a, a, like a, a lace knit so uh Nick and I are part of a local knitting group here so I immediately called them up and I was like you're not gonna believe this it's wood anatomy and <laughs> lace knit so that's kind of how the project originated. Um, be yeah, kind of it came to fruition um, through a lot of ups and downs after that, and different wonderful avenues. Um, yeah, but that's the kind of background and the the research basis of the project. Uh, yeah, Nick, anything else? Um, I I just want to. The only reason I'm a part of this was because Ellen called me. Uh, when they were in the lab and uh, I was like oh my god just like knit it um, <laughs> and then Ellen Ellen knitted it and then I was like oh my god um, whenever it, it, it's such a privilege to be a, a, in a university so every semester I try to take like a a dance class or a art class because it's just a opportunity that I would love to take part in if I'm having access to these resources so I can tell more just stories and equitable stories potentially through artwork um, and I think that's something that Ellen and I hold intention in our work but um I, th that semester I just randomly picked printmaking because I'd never done a printmaking course before and I it sounded really interesting so then I uh signed up and started taking it because I really wanted to do woodblock printing um and like I can show an example of what it looks like this is a block of wood from southern Alabama a similar region to Ellen's but inland uh from uh the land and uh, not the water and then Specifically, this like kind of wood shows. Uh, uh, could you just yeah. put it? Are you, oh yeah, you know, is that yeah. So you could all yeah. Say, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. So that white ring specifically, I want to draw your attention to shows uh, European colonization and settler colonialism within the region, and I think that's like the beauty of printmaking is it can render visual uh, through the wood bodies of trees. Um, these really textured stories of settler colonialism or other kind of underflowing uh, stories. So that's what Ellen and I tried to do is we took Ellen's beautifully knitted work and then we just crushed it through the printmaking press basically with a bunch of pressure and then it uh, inked it up of course prior and then it transferred over the, the body of the lace knitted work into the paper. Um, so then that's how we held all three in kind of uh, tension together, the microtoming that Ellen did, the lace knitting Ellen did, and then the printing that we both did. That's really lovely to know. I was trying to get the others like dropping emails to see if they're joining. 
Okay, so I was wondering, because you all showed such brilliant art pieces, especially the wood that Ellen showed, <clears throat> I was wondering that, um, you know, we always think of, you know, there is a market for, for you know, there's an illegal market that exists for things that are not so widely available or very interestingly available and has an interesting story to it. I was thinking, is it a possibility within geography and geographical, you know, uh, commodities or items that we that we use for our own research they hold certain market value outside and you know circulating in those markets where you know some people who have a knack for storing these very you know old things and, and they would call it antiques but you know getting hold of environmental uh, items that belong to from that that come from ages beyond you know, would there be a kind of market that there that is there? And how do, you know, we as when we think of climate, when we think of art, how do we handle it? Because one of the most important thing in art and museology is how things have been stolen or, you know, misappropriated, put in a different place from where they actually used to belong for so long, for so many years. So how do, you know, these pieces that we use for our own research and artistically present them, you know, catch the eye for such kind of a market? Have you faced something like this? Um, I know that the trees that, uh, like the underwater forest area, once the news kind of broke, um, at least from like the, the lore that's been passed down of researchers who have been involved with this project way longer than I have, um, is that uh, a lot like the uh, fishermen and folks who were involved with the project um, uh, began getting a lot of calls for um, from folks who wanted to like who wanted to purchase the wood um, to build, be like built into tables or um, incorporate into like wood craftsmanship. Um, uh, so that was, I, I haven't really thought about that until just now, but yeah, like putting a, like putting a price on like the body of the wood itself, um, because of its like really wonky timeline, um, because of its age, uh, because of, I don't know if they'd be thinking about what it represents in terms of, um, like the climate stories that it's embodied and is recording. Um, Yeah. Also, I want. Uh, <laughs> okay. Also, I wonder that we are bringing academy and art together. Are you know, is any among you uh, an artist here, or have uh, associated your, yourself with a formal training, or just you know pondered upon how you use art in your life, and how you know how academia, art, your own political ideologies and individual identities come to merge together when you do this work and you know what the other kind of works that you have been undertaking or would undertake reflect the same mm -hmm. yeah I'm one of those uh I I was going to go to art school that was like my dream throughout um all of middle school and high school uh, to the point where I was like, I did a early college program at the School of the Institute of Chicago and, um, you know, like was was doing portfolio days. Uh, but then kind of had a really major shift in my interests and uh, towards like the latter part of my high school career, um, partially driven by uh, lots of anger and fear I felt towards climate change and actions from the Trump administration at that point and withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So uh, kind of then began working more within um, environmental related uh, subjects at school. Um, but I've always then like held art very, very deeply uh, and have tried to work with like uh, and still like exercising creative practices in uh, what I do. Um, and so uh for a time I was working for a land trust and I absolutely loved uh one of our like annual like triannual newsletters that we did um we uh had the opportunity to make a comic for it um so illustrated how beavers have shaped a landscape so that was kind of uh 
a really wonderful opportunity to implement arts into more like conservation minded, um, more like a, a, like a applied ecological work uh, for definitely more like science communication with the public in that. Um, but this was probably the first project where it was working like within research and using like, and like practicing art as an extension of that research. Uh, so. That's lovely to know. And I have a few more questions, but I'll wait for Nick. Uh, to... <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think Ellen and I have like very similar, like parallel lived experiences in many ways. Um, I was like going to school to become a piano uh, teacher um, up until like my first year of college and then kind of the school of music kind of uh, uh, ruined the passion that I had for music. Um, and I then transferred over to botanical sciences. And uh, I've always, I, I think um, I've always been interested in like these very like scrappy forms of art making, um, kind of art that's made out of necessity, like environmental activist work uh, and climate activist work. Um, like just like making posters and signs or paper mache projects um, writ large. It, it just like generally these like scrappy forms of art and doodling, especially um, that's like Ellen's. I, um, we, we talk about comics and doodling a lot. Um, and that's during my master's work, I was able to incorporate illustration, botanical illustrations and doodles into my like written textual piece, which was really fun. Um, but this was definitely the first time that I had like fully synthesized both of these disciplines together, or, um, really like mesh them um, much more to where like you can't tease them apart. The botanical illustrations were like fine, but like you could remove them from the textual piece and it like didn't like really uh the textual piece still stood there um but this piece in particular like uh the accompanying textual piece and the written um the triptych in itself are like so interlaced now in a really fun way that like i i really like that this project has gotten to that point because i think it tells the most textured and vivid stories um demanding like these forms of justice that specifically climate justice that's brilliant. Yeah, 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 no, oh, please. Yeah, yeah, I love the point you bring up of like, yeah, scrappy art form, because I think there's such like talking about like the, the price and like funding that went into um, the different dimensions of this project. There's like just the vast difference in like the amount of money that was required to like bring these stumps up and to purchase that microtome versus the the knitted component like that yarn was from um, a like a bag of scrap fabric and scrap yarn that um, so like friends and neighbors at the local knitting group brought in. So that one was absolutely free and like like uh, gifted from a community um, network here and with the accompanying like uh, then advice and suggestions on how to go about knitting it on its own, yeah. I was thinking, Ellen, you talk about the newsletter and the comics that you have made. So do you have a name for the newsletter that if, you know, our listeners want to go and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, sign up for it? And if there is this comic, if they could see it somewhere. Oh, and... <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I'll drop it in the chat. Um, But for folks who want to know more about the organization and support uh just a small, um, like a regional nonprofit based in Southern Indiana, which is where I'm from. Um, uh, yeah, so I worked for Sycamore Land Trust, it was called, uh, is called, um, and I was a land steward there, uh, but part of my duties were also doing, um, writing articles for a, let's see, uh, our triannual newsletter, which was called uh, The Twig, that was sent out to, um, uh, members and other community members who would ask who like would request it uh but yeah I can definitely send the link to the pdf here so every issue has is, had a different uh theme to it and this was the wildlife issue um and it was let me go here so this is a link to the pdf and then the beaver comic uh is pops in around page 10. So. Oh, that's lovely. And you know, it why we're having this panel is to not just focus on what we did in the blog, but to, you know, talk and disseminate what more the readers of, of this blogs could, could find um, 
uh, important as well as helpful in the you know in their academic journey while while they also try to because what i think is what i have faced as as uh, uh, an artist academic is there is not much acceptance there's always this little skepticism that there is if art and academia comes together so as nick also says that uh, you know there is this blend you know you know piano music art painting that is somehow it's taken to be an expression of how you express yourself but then i have always felt that uh, academy and research is also how you express you know your thoughts your critical thoughts of things but there has been so much skepticism of getting the both together though both are a form of expression okay I will move forward to talking more about your research, but I think we have another panelist join us. She is Kelly. I would like to extend my warm welcome to her. And uh, we are still waiting for her uh, uh, co-writer and colleague to join us. While we wait for that, I'll introduce the both of them. Uh, so Kelly Young and Carlin Peddleton, Gemins. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, kindly forgive me and let me know if I pronounced it wrong. So Kelly Yang and Carlin uh, are writers and professors in the School of Education at Trent University. They are founding member Hi. of the Trent Arts Research Group, TARG. Uh, very well, ben Hi. welcome, <laughs> Kelly. We are waiting for Carlin to join. Oh, Carlin's here. I can see her. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we'll give her a, a minute to catch a break. So, yes, Carlin, I just introduced yourself and it's just like, it's very, uh, what I should say, it's, it's lovely you just entered at that very moment your introduction got over. So I would like to ask both of you, like I did for the, for the panelists before, uh, how did you come across this research and why did you want to bring in arts into academia? And the brilliant article, the blog post that you have on curriculum, why did you both think it was necessary? Carlene, do you want to start or would you like me to start? She's just checking it. I can start with that. Uh, thank you very much for your question and thank you for having us here today. Um, I think what happened was we were kind of getting lost right before the pandemic in, in our ways in the academy. And it was something that was to bring us together. We really felt that it would bring community together as well with researchers and a lot of mentorship. Um, so graduate students, uh, we run a colloquia. And I think it just really is important to, you know, do the work. I know that the the narratives have been in in the academy. You know, are the arts? Is there a place? I think that we make that place, and I think that um, in doing so, we show them, we showcase how. Uh, you know, we theorize, but we also are able to work with the you know with the arts to to help us work through. Um, you know, lots of different forms of research and uh, to bring this form as an illegit a legitimate form in the academy. Um, you know, we've, uh, Carlene and I have been working in this field now, my goodness, I want to say well over 20 years. And I know that 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 question was was with us for many years of it, where it was always this sense that we had to justify the arts in the academy and how, you know, what are our methodologies and so on. And I just really feel that now we're in a place where I think that it's it's time. Um, qualitative research is, is very important. It has its place. Uh, we're able to do really wonderful work together. So of course, when the pandemic hit, it, it just became even more important. And so creating this uh, Trent Arts Research Group um, has, been, has been a really wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, we, we believe in mentorship because I think it's an important, you need a place for that. So we created a place and we're very focused um, around eco-social justice and indigenous 
perspectives, um, you know, on a broader scale. So, but we welcome all perspectives in terms of critical um, art space research that that happens. So, it's a it's a really wonderful opportunity. And then uh, through the colloquia, we are able to um, run workshops, and Carlene can speak uh, more to those things. Uh, but it's a really just to give a background of why why this is so important, how we can be a model for other institutions and, you know, and really sort of um, think about how we can move these kinds of things forward and hope that there is that sense that people are getting um, a feel for the importance of the arts, the environment and, and the academy and how it all comes together through, uh, you know, our interconnectedness with the world. So I'll turn it over to Carlene. Thanks for having us. Sure, and uh, uh, my apologies. Uh, we had it in our had written it down as four o'clock, and we're like, wait, uh oh. Uh, so uh, really sorry for this lateness. Uh, we were all prepping for our four o'clock panel, which is at three. Anyway, I just want to say that. Um, yeah, a, a few thoughts, and I know there's multiple questions, so. Hopefully I won't try to say everything in one thought. But Kelly and I actually did our PhDs together, you know, we won't say how long ago, but, you know, a while ago. And um, there were some arts-based um, professors there. And honestly, I mean, I think Kelly would say the same thing. Like, we saw how they were treated, like how they were whispered about behind their backs. And we were like, I was like, I come from creative writing, I got MFA in creative writing, and I was like, well, this is silly, but I'm also not dumb, so I was like, okay, I'm going to have my whole writing life over here in, like, downtown Toronto bars doing performances, <laughs> which is a lot of fun, and then give them, like, I picked a, you know, methodology form that was as close as I could, which was, like, um, critical ethnography right that was like kind of traditionally the place where literary people went you know to present anyway so I had that and I had that dual life and I mean I always brought creative into it but I had the dual life but then you know then Kelly and I end up uh and I'm not just coincidentally but we I followed her to Trent University and as we've kind of you know you know got jobs and got tenure etc we're like well we don't want everybody else to like have these dual identities and you know weirdnesses like why don't we just make a place where the norm is that the arts people are actually in charge and rule the place and are cooler and more interesting than everyone else which i think we pulled off i think we've pulled that off so one of the ways that i had like initially how um our kind of research in our piece came about was I thought in 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 aid of this a uh, mission which is you know Kelly's with me on uh, um I thought okay why don't we I'm gonna just get some money like apply for a little grant and put together a what I call I go we're gonna call it a creative colloquium where we just come together and do arts-based research together and then all the grad students can see that this is a thing and it's actually the people kind of running the department that are doing it. So I just thought if we had a critical mass, we could turn the tide and just make it like, yeah, this is what we're doing. So anyway, that's, that's kind of a bit how it came about. Now, what was interesting is initially, and all of our work is embedded in environmental ed as well. And we thought, okay, so we'll put together a piece um, where there's kind of creative, it, it, it's funny because I, I wanted the environment, but it's, you know, one of those things where you're, how many are you doing, you know, things I thought, okay, we got this call for a theater review with thought, Okay. Why don't we try to do improv like out in our green space is green. Uh, Trent is this, I don't know if you've been here come visit because it's like gorgeous, you know? So we'll just see what inspires us, what kind of conversations we end up. But I'm picturing in this whole thing, you know, that maybe Kelly and I are doing an improv or, you know, whatever. All the different participants are doing this improv, but in the natural setting. But what happened was COVID nailed us <laughs> again. You know, it just kept coming back every time you thought you got. 
And so I was like, well, you know, as any good educator will, that's no problem. What we meant to do anyway was to have you go interact, write a poem, do something with the nature around you, which it was on a dime that we switched it up. But to be fair, we were kind of seeing and hearing that because of COVID, people were like way more connected to the land around them. So what ended up happening was the improv then became between the each individual person, wherever they were, and the land around them. And then like it really, I mean, it sounds a little bit fluffy. I don't know. But it, it really worked where it was kind of a dialogue opened up between the, the people, the the researcher, the grad student, the faculty, and the, their land, like in a way that they had never done before COVID. And the and then when I was reading, I wasn't a, a you know expert in this, but I was reading the principles of improv. They say improv only works if you you never say no, right? You never say no. You you have to be open. And then lead it to the next. So whatever Kelly throws at me, I don't go no. Because in the in the in the improv, you have to go, yeah, and well, and what you know, and then you lead it to another discussion. You have to be open. And so we were like, oh my god, all of these, this worked because it wasn't that you had the outside out there that you were ignoring. It was that actually they became open to the land. They became open to the improv with the land. So it was pretty cool, right? How that happens. You know, you don't realize you're thinking this, your your best laid plans get changed. But then this kind of beautiful thing happened where the arts and the environment came together in a really fundamental way. So this plan of having us to do arts in the environment became an active conversation between the two. And because we had facilitated, we went, okay, anybody who wants to, because everybody, you know, especially when you're grad student, you're trying to figure out how to get a publication. So we said, anybody who wants to can be part of our publication. And, you know, let's, why not? We don't we don't need them now, right? We don't need the publications now. So um, so we end up with like eight people. We're like, whatever, scientists do it all the time. Why not? Why not us? Uh, but because of this, too, Kelly and I kept our own pieces out of it because we just thought, you know, We've already hit the, and then we're like, well, that's kind of sad because we had this kind of beautiful engagement. And both of us really, um, you know, again, you don't do this on purpose and it was a coincidence, but we both ended up capturing in different ways those, that kind of time, that kind of moment when like life kind of breaks open again after the, not after, but kind of right at the end of the winter thaw. Like the ground literally breaks, the buds, you know, like, the, and for her, the birds, well, she could talk about that. And we we're like, okay, what? Well, that's interesting. We both latched on to that kind of breaking open, you know, and kind of what is possible in those moments when the ground breaks open or the, the life breaks open again. And we're like, that's a curriculum moment. So, so when we saw, we didn't have that in this kind of formula. We, and when we saw the call for this one, we're like, this is our chance. This is our chance to kind of look at what we did with this curriculum. And, you know, that's separate from that whole kind of larger piece that was like, we will support you all in getting this big journal article because you need to get jobs. We already have jobs. <laughs> we want to <laughs> be able to have like experimental do this stuff. We, we get a chance for our own pieces to come out. Anyway, that was a lot. Hope that's uh <laughs> I'm very grateful and glad to have met you people and find found you know like-minded people who are wanting to break the the traditional and conventional notions of how research or academy has been done. I was thinking Likewise. if uh, Kelly and Carlin, you'll have any newsletter that our readers and listeners could uh, sign into as you both were also talking about the workshops and how could people collaborate with you from different universities so that they can bring these workshops that you all do to their universities? That's a good question. Do we have the TARG? Does the TARG list our different workshops? 
Do we have you the, send the... It to us letter? But maybe you know, just if you have something like, just tell us so that you know we know that we have to mark it out when we put the videos. We out. have a, we have a website, so that's why I was looking to see if we can put that into your. Um... People could contact you directly if they would want to have a, oh, a yeah. work. Similarly. Oh, that's great. And I was also thinking, like I was also asking Nick and Ellen, uh, you and, uh, you know, uh, Kelly, uh, ha do you have any uh, history or attachment to like art? Like not just like, as you said, you took a degree in creative writing, but uh, apart from that has, you know, has that kind of artistic endeavor always uh, was always inside of you as a child, like maybe going to a piano yeah. class, Nick was saying, or oh, wanting to pick up an art course, which uh, <laughs> Ellen could not. You know, some, you know, those things that they also form you and your idea, because I see you have a brilliant Frida Kahlo's portrait just behind you. And uh, <laughs> Frida Kahlo was my, my first, you know, yeah, when I talk of art, research, life, my political <laughs> ideology, my identity, how I how I look at myself and define. Oh yes, yes, thank you. We can we can see her. Uh, this oh, was my. the first, you know, her life, her story. Oh yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I had also taught a course, uh, you know, a self bit curriculum on the life and time and art of Frida Kahlo to talk about oh, how cool. life, idea, identity came together. You know, I think art, idea, identity, everything that we do in our life comes together just like it came together in Frida's life. How would you both uh, talk about a little about that? How did it merge into your life? You want to go first? Sure, yes. I can go. Yeah. Yeah, go <laughs> or if anybody else would like to go first. Um, well, I can say that, um, interestingly, I did a painting in my dissertation. And so at that time, it was very much like I had to almost make the argument for the painting as a visual representation, because it was very much, um, you know, part of, of understanding and being like the ontology, the epistemology was through the arts. Um, it was looking at uh, the Girl Guide movement with the badges and the, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and thinking about our relationship with the arts and why a painting and other poetry were important to the dissertation. But it really felt like I had to write a whole explanation for it rather than it be standalone. So it's almost like we get to do double the work, which we're passionate about, but there is a sense of that. And then my real work um, has been uh, working, real work, I mean, the work that I, I do that's outside the dissertation and, you know, a lot of writing and so on, um, has been working with an artist uh, using ekphrastic poetics. And that's a response to a painting um, or an art form in, in poetic form. And so we would have, she would paint and I would do some poems and it was sort of telling stories. And sometimes it was more fluid where I do the poem and she would paint. So these are things that I like to bring into my classes um, to bring in arts-based uh, pieces for students to see, um, to understand that, you know, arts-based curriculum uh, can be a really powerful medium. And so it sustains me. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, a group that we work with that um, just, you know, for creative summer, summer visuals, we have musicians, we have uh, writers, and sort of open and welcome all forms. So yeah, it's been, it's been quite the journey, but to, to be bold back then to put a painting in was kind of fun, um, you know, but, but also a little bit like, oh, you know, you still felt like you had to had to make the arguments that, you know, I felt like I had to do a whole big work around why I should be allowed to have a painting on top of a dissertation, you see? So, yeah, so that was something, um, obviously, a little bit longer ago, but we certainly, of course, Carlene's into film. I'm going to let her speak for a bit because she has many, uh, many different forms. Yeah, so I just wanted to put one thing here. Very recently, someone I know, 
has completed a PhD. She has drawn a comic. So the entire thesis was drawn. It was from New York University. Her name is Shohini mm -hmm. K. There must, I don't know if there are, you know, I'm not exposed to other people's work. So I don't know if there are more students who are doing this now. But I think the space is opening up for many more work like this, you know, where you just entirely paint your thesis. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I mean, Kelly and I were both influenced by a woman named uh, Rishma Dunlop, a professor uh, that was at York. And she claims, I think this is true, to have written the first Canadian dissertation as a novel. And she has quite a lovely article about like, even if you don't get through the dissertation, she has a lovely article about why that's important, what a novel offers you as a methodology, what kind of you know, not, I won't say answers, but what kind of knowledge it uncovers, uh, off, offers. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I have another, I have a graphic novel that was a dissertation that I bought that I was like moved, but I can't remember if it's the same name as you said, but I think it was called Flattening or something. I don't remember. I'll just find it, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, it's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, so I would say, uh, when I was a kid, because you're saying, how did it, yeah, when I was a kid, you're right. Like, when I was a kid, I had my, like, mostly I was, like, a little jock thing, running the streets, uh, playing basketball, and even though I'm short, but I don't know, soccer, and baseball, and I thought reading was for girls because I was dumb, you know, I was like, I you know, that wasn't what we did. I went in, I played, I watched TV. So if you had told me, does this relate to you as a kid? I was like, no. Like I thought if I got good at math, then I could beat the boys. That was like, I feel like it was a very kind of boyhood competitive situation in my brain. That said, as you say that, and also, you know, math does often come together with music. I always uh, played French horn, like pretty much from eight years old to 19 or 20. So that was probably the main art form. If you had said, could you write? I would be like, no, I knew I wasn't good at that. And which is ironic because that's probably what I'm best at now, you know, but at the time, the social categories kept me from it. But I had the great fortune of landing when I was 17 uh, into um, this uh, uh, kind of famous American writer, um, Shuri Moraga's uh, class that was a composition, it was like Chicano studies composition, it was Mexican American studies, you know, by progressive lefty kind of people. Anyway, and all of a sudden, writing and literature was not, not um, I don't know, static on the page and boring. It was like, of course, you do this because this is your politics, this is your activism. Like, it was all about politics and activism and fun and performance and creating beauty. Like you didn't want to be dogmatic, but you didn't, there was a way like if you, I couldn't even imagine like the writing was directly tied to trying to make the world a better place. That was it. That was why you did it. Now you also did it so you could perform, <laughs> you know, like, but I'll give you I'll give you uh, just an example. Like by the time I went to do the MFA in creative writing, I got there. I was in San Diego. I had a great experience, but I got there. I and I had left San Francisco area, which was very political activist, and a lot of people there were writing, and they didn't relate it all to politics. And I honestly, I was like 22 and I just didn't, I actually cognitively didn't understand. I'm like, what do you mean? You just wrote a story about the lake. I don't know. <laughs> you got drunk at the lake. Okay. I mean, now like the lake could be beautiful, but at the time I didn't know about the environment. I grew up in LA. Nobody cared about the environment. So I was like, I don't understand what even motivates you to write a story about getting drunk at the lake it just i didn't, just didn't understand it i was like what like you because it's hard to write 
<laughs> I was like, how do you even see to me? Like if I had a political cause, and again, I'm not talking about being dogmatic or creating poor art, but I thought if I had a political cause, then I could, I had so much more power, you know, so much more. So anyway. Um, we all have to so wait what, for a time, you know, the thing to break, the ice to melt. That's but I think new, that, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, but that when you say, like, how did you kind of bring it together, overcome it? It was like, to me, I'm trying to work on creating a better world. So mm -hmm. if somebody makes fun of me for bringing arts into the academy, that's so secondary to my impulse of trying to, you know, like what I got uh, with the guy, wait, wait, he's like, all art is political, all art, you know, all art is life, all art is political. It's like, yeah, so I was like, okay, you're gonna make fun of me, but my point is trying to help. You know, like I was running a queer youth theater group, and you know the kids are coming in with their their wrists cut up, and you're like, oh my god, can we perform theater together in the community, and somehow that meaningfulness makes it worth living for? I don't know. Like I'm not, you know, like. You never know who you save or you don't save. You can't do it like I'm going to go out and save them. But it was just this strong impulse that to me like was really had nothing to do with the academy. So like we have very little time left and we would like to take a few questions if there are from the audience. The last question that I have is for all four of you is by bringing in arts into academia, and are you know the bringing art as a personal politics to deal with academic work and writing and academic performatives as is asked of us um are we looking at a time where we are going to break this um uh, disciplinary boundaries that exist are we looking at a post disciplinary world where the tradition and the convention have a possibility of melting down and we have an advantage of bringing everything together through various new research methods, especially through arts. What do we think? What might happen by this intervention? You all can just go as you like and put forward your idea. Uh, this is, I'll jump in really quick. This is something Ellen and I talk a lot about. So we're both at the same institution and uh, we are like deeply saturated within the dominant elitist sciences, right? Like we are in physical geography, mm -hmm. earth and spatial sciences. And mm -hmm. I think like this question of like, I think art is already post-disciplinary in so many ways. It's the elite sciences that need to have the like undisciplinary to do. And I think that's what Ellen and I try to do is like, we're bringing in like the queer trans imaginaries. We're trying to bring in some like indigenous based activism work that we're inspired by, right? Like we're trying to bring in all these other disciplines that they would silo away while arts is like, no, like we see everything pretty open. It's like the undisciplining that needs to happen in the earth and spatial sciences that like we're working to do. And there's pushback of course, but like, it's always like, like you were saying, Carlene, like it, it it's what we have to do, right? There's like an impulse in us that like forces us to do it. Like mm -hmm. that false sense of awe that that person is writing about the lake is like really steeped in a very big politic already, even though they might not mm -hmm. say it, it totally is, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's just this undisciplining that has to happen. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, you, you said that so beautifully, Nick. It's just like, I, the, I, just like being able to almost like, like it's this privilege of being able to like, oh, let's like bring like from within the dominant sciences. Oh, let's like bring us into conversation mm -hmm. with these other disciplines. It's like, no, like we are already fully enmeshed within those conversations. We are like embodying it. Our bodies are already inherently politicized in everything that we do. So why not? <laughs> Carlin and Kelly, you want to put in what you think about it? If arts would be taking us to a post-disciplinary era, oh. mm. I, I, I mean, mean, I hope I hope we're already there for most people. I mean, we don't know everybody's experiences, and I think this is why we want to mentor grad students because we're concerned that they didn't have to go through what we or don't want them to go through what we went through. Sort of the fight, the fight on top of doing all your work. Um, but yeah, I, I do see activism is what we do. I mean, we're promoting 
these important, um, you know, topics across across all like it's intersectionality for sure and positionality and and embracing all those things i think too um to make it happen and honestly um you know when when you're not embracing the arts i was almost at a point where i said like i think it's going to be time to retire and carly's like no you can't retire we have to start we have to start targ so <laughs> she just brings so much life and i and i'm thankful for that and i'm thankful that I meet people all the time that do the arts and absolutely we have a colloquium. Uh, we, I do believe we will have a link so we could invite um, people across because I know sometimes it's hard to get in person. So um, that information will be on our TARG website shortly. We just had a meeting today and uh, we're very excited. Uh, you'll love some of the speakers. Uh, we do a forest walk um, that is very important. And as Carlene said, when we had to pivot in the, in the pandemic, we did, but it didn't mean we still didn't go forward. So, um, yeah, so it's wonderful. I hope, hope that's, uh, adding to the conversation. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry to hear you're getting bumped around over there too. Um, and I was saying so, to someone today, disciplines, certainly discipline us like left and right. And they prevent us from seeing beyond them right you know and we were talking about that whole concept you know and as you were talking I mean, I'm clearly I'm not an expert in the sciences or anything but you know I often find like inspiration to write like by watching you know they always say like we're at a very indigenous institution too you know land is the first teacher you know we watch it we feel it we see it in order to think about how to even get through a meeting you know, like you watch the animals, you watch the land, you watch everything because it teaches you things, you know. And I often found uh, I would watch it and learn something and that would go into a story I was writing, you know. And I thought, oh, why why would we have this thing blocking us, you know. Uh, why why would we say nature isn't art, you know, like or or science, you know. Again, I don't know your particulars on science, but science is a lot about the, the elements of the world, you know, and actually one of the indigenous scholars, um, uh, Leanne, you know, Leanne, uh, Z Zap, Zap, I, I can't say her, I don't know how to say Leanne her. Leanne Simpson. No, 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 our student, Zap. Oh, our Leanne, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, she just was giving a presentation on it once and she's like, yeah, like, like the land, like that's, that is art like the land is art it's like the best example of art it's all creation it's beautiful the reason why it's beautiful is it's art because it's like if we're talking about the principle of creativity it's like the first creativity of course it's art and i was like oh yeah i know maybe that sounds dumb you thought of but i was like i think i thought oh i'm doing art over here and i was like this is like, like the first teacher in how to do art this is art out there right sorry that's my you know, I can go out there. It's beautiful out there. But um, anyway, so I was thinking about that. And then I was also thinking about um, just, uh, you know, I, I think probably there was always still some insecurity of like, oh, yeah, but I can't, you know, I didn't learn how to do quantitative, you know, so maybe my stuff isn't as valuable, you know, and even though ridiculous, because I go, it depends on the question. But, you know, which methodology is best? That's because you're trying to answer particular questions you know but it's also I think what you're good at and what your impulse is you know and I remember saying that to we were in a, a methodologies class and uh, actually as my former supervisors there and I was like well what about stats when are we using stats when are we using this when are we using that and she goes but it's also about your knowledge being heard your knowledge being listened to to have your effect on the like the whole idea of an artist is to like connect with other people. And she said, which I'm not saying this to be arrogant, but it was a really nice thing for a teacher to say to you, you know, even though I was a grown up, she's a grown up. She's like, Carlene, you're a really good writer. If I could write like that, that's what I would do because you're heard. Figure out what you can do to be heard. Like, because people always say, oh, it's this very scientific thing. I figure out the, the, the methodology and the question, all this. But she added to that. But it's, do what, you know, what you're, like, good at, 
too and what you're interested in. And maybe that's part of forming the question too. Like if you like, so I don't know what kind of art you, but like you're a visual artist, work that into your methodology. <laughs> like, because so, tons of people that will stay with them in ways that coding an interview will never stay with people. Right. So anyway, I think that goes, and I've seen some kind of incredible quantitative art projects as well that I was like, Oh, I didn't know where they were using the numbers in digital form to create patterns and create like paintings of the digital, you know, based on quantitative data. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. So that's the other thing of just opening spaces for everybody to bring what they're up to together. Cause um, whether it's in classes or cloaking, because that's where you learn a ton, you know? Anyway. Thank you all. I I wish we had more time, but as you know, we all find little time out of our own schedules, come together to have the important talk that we should have been having long ago. So before I um, invite Noala to <laughs> talk to you about the questions, if we have any, and the comments, I did see a, a two or three comments in the in the uh, chat box, and also Jessica, if uh, you know she would like to put forward some point. I would like to say that this is not the end, uh, and I do envision this, uh, what we have formed together by means of this uh, blog post series, you know, to bring this forward in much more other collaborations and to take this forward, uh, you know, and not stop this work because it's very rare to find like-minded people who do work which is not very acceptable in the conventional sense of term. So I open the floor to Nuala uh, and she'll jump in now with uh, the questions we might have and the comments. So Nuala? You're there? Yeah, thanks, Amrita. Um, so I'm just looking at the comments. I don't know if, Beth, you have a wonderful comment. If you want me to say it out loud, I will. Or if you'd like to say it yourself, please go ahead. Hi. Was, was that the one about um, uh, integrating uh, outside of academia, academia within academia? Yeah, I thought it was such a wonderful, yeah. a wonderful comment. So yeah, because I've been, I've been, I'm a long term student, as you'll hear about when, uh, when I'm no doubt when I'm doing my panel thing, and uh, but of course, uh, you do your work outside of of ac academia, and I find making connections back in uh, very difficult, you know, and sometimes it's important to be able to make connections uh, with um, uh, with academia. So, um, but it, it seems to be just focused on, on, you know, on students, you know, we've got a budget, we've got this, got to do this and this time and all that sort of thing. So I hope that uh, uh, we can think about ways of integrating artists and creative folks outside into the the whole realm of the um, research creation network. So that's what I'd like to pursue maybe in these conversations in the next couple of weeks. That's brilliant, Beth. I'm, I'm on board with that um, completely. Um, Jessica, do you want me to read out your comment or do you want to go for it yourself? Uh, I'm happy to say it out loud um no i was just saying as someone who uh purposely left formal academia but have kept my toe in and call myself academic adjacent um and someone who's very dedicated to communicating our work to a broader audience to the general public i'm endlessly frustrated with how people in academia will wring their hands about oh, is this in my disciplinary boundary? Does this blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no one cares. Like literally no one cares the difference between environmental humanities, historical geography, environmental studies. Like no one outside of your little tiny bubble cares. What they care about is your knowledge 
and your ability to build a relationship with them and to communicate with them and to teach them and to learn from them in return. Like that's what matters, not the disciplinary boundaries. So that's just what I was saying there. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. That's like so, so important. I really appreciate that question and comment. I, I have a quick question. We, we don't have a lot of questions in the, in the chat right now. Um, but, uh, you know, what I hear from what you're all saying, which is just like incredible, my brain is simmering on so many aspects of this, is that the, the pandemic seemed to have been some sort of rupture in the way that people began to see the world or didn't see the world or, you know. Um, I, I wonder, could you say a little bit more about, have you noticed a shift in the way, because particularly because so much of, uh, you know, uh, college and, and high school and all schooling went sort of virtual went on like online do you notice a difference in the ways that people are now um connecting to uh art science and everything that you know brings them two together so if any any of the panelists have any thoughts please feel free to just jump in i i, I don't know uh <laughs> That's a good, I think that's its own thesis right there, or, or our project, or both. Um, I mean, I, I think it's probably been said, I don't want to be cliche, but I just feel like it just, you know, it stopped everybody. And so it um, made possible all kinds of thinking, like, what, what do you value in your life, you know? What, like... Yeah, maybe baked bread or you know whatever, but I don't. I just I, I don't know if any um, uh, if any research has been done. It probably is, but I don't know. Like I feel like around me, um, people started thinking about what they wanted to do with their lives more. You know, like and maybe as somebody had said earlier, just a moment ago, like. Well, even if, you know, and who was saying that? They said they don't care really what you're doing. You know, um, even if they do, you don't care anymore about what they think. You know, like, you know, for those four people that think they're smarter than you, like, you're like, I just, look, we just saw the world kind of stop. And um, I, I feel like, and even around me and in my own life, so many people I know went, I don't want to do my job anymore. I want to get a different job or I don't want to do the job um, the way I've been doing it all these years. I'm not doing it that way anymore. I mean, it was kind of uh, dramatic, it seemed like, in the ways that we kind of wanted to live our lives differently. And so it would seem to me and hopefully that that might be true in what you're asking for around art and science too, but I haven't done that research. That sounds beautiful, you know? Sounds like beautiful research. Would anyone else of the panelists like to jump in? I just quickly want to plug, um, I'm going to put our contact information, Ellen and mine. We are, we participated in this uh, Trans Ecology Symposium and led a little like illustrating workshop or play shop we called it on field notes and we're taking the method of a field note and then bastardizing it um so please reach out just if you want to join in that art collective that's currently ongoing i know you all are plugging your beautiful pieces and you uh, please share it with your graduate students uh it's pri primarily a graduate student-led project but anybody's welcome of course um and then also you don't have to be queer or trans to be involved in it we are specifically looking for allies and advocates to join us because we currently have zero so it's a very homogenous group on the other end of the spectrum there um i just wanted to plug that really quick though but it's a i think the covid showed that we can make these like international connects and connections that we didn't i didn't, I didn't think i could have ideated prior to the pandemic yeah i think that's true too where are you all anyway i mean apart from virtual space we're in virtual idaho yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. cool yeah but currently within the transfield collective is what we're calling it or this this iteration it's folks who are based in australia and um oh gosh in europe i, I forget Belgium. where yeah Belgium. yep yep um yeah different universities uh across the states as well so yeah highly rec yeah 
if anyone is interested in participating, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful working and collaborative uh, and just like still growing project, so. How do we uh, get on your list or just, I mean, I don't know if I can or not. I probably, Kelly's probably gonna tell, I told you to stop saying. Yes, if you just uh, plug us an email, that'd be great. But basically like okay. what it is, is we have a bunch of prompts that are inspired by queer and trans theory, as well as like our own experiences oh. in huh. field sciences, because we awesome. felt very deeply uncomfortable in those field science spaces. So then we're like, let's draw it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's what kind of is the inspiration of the project, but it's been meandering and like, we're finding the contours of the river as we go for sure. Beautiful. Can we send a brochure out to our students and, and share it among faculty and, and just because we like technology, we can do that. Yeah. We can drop you a PDF um, that we yeah. have. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We can certainly get it out on the wire. Cause I think that that would be really helpful. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, this is fantastic. I, I have one very sort of um, kind of tricky question to ask. So I'm going to throw it out there, but there might not be an answer or you might need time to think about it. Um, so it's it's always really striking to me when, uh, as whether you're a scientist, an artist or whatever way that you identify yourself is I'm really interested in people that gatekeep particular disciplines and they kind of hold the bounds of it and so in trying to break that in the way that I view it is that there's obviously a lot of fear around moving into a space that's new to you for whatever reason and so I, I just wondered how would somebody who is very reluctant or very rigid about either the field or talking about across disciplines or talking about the integration of art into what is science and so sort of like solidified um what would you want them to do to change that and what i mean by that is like is there resources that you would suggest them to dip their toe in if they're like oh my god this whole thing is all new to me because i know for a lot of people that like even stuff like queer theory is new so it's like mm -hmm. where would you start that journey when you're like oh my god i'm so afraid to get into the classroom and talk about a topic that I don't feel I'm an expert in because I love the idea of being an expert. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about people that love to gatekeep these fields. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but I thought I'd throw it out there. There's a really smart scholar, smart as in like very wise at our institution. I just want to pass along her words. Her name's Vanessa Anthony Stevens. I'll plug her any day I can. Um, but she said that uh, when you're like trying to get into these spaces, find your people, invite them up to your treehouse, and then pull up the ladder. And I think that that is like the best <laughs> advice I've gotten like this entire like my entire grad school experience is she just said it in passing. I was like, whoa, time out. Like, can we jump back to that? And I think it's so true of like, find the people that will like help you get into those spaces and then just like yank up the ladder because you, that, you know, like extractive folks will keep on extracting. Um, yeah, but that advice, I just want to pass along her advice. She's genius. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, you know, we kind of in a sense did that, but I'm really glad to have that image now. But we wanted to form this group and it, like it comes mostly out of education, but of course it's open to anybody across the campus. And like early on, right away, we said, we had people come and say, well, you haven't invited so-and-so and you haven't invited so-and-so and they are very esteemed and it's an insult, you know, to their artist, art, artisanal, I don't know. And I was like, yeah, I don't, if, that's not what we're doing so we had to like just have a sit down really fast like i don't know if you know but there's a a book that was by a harvard business no sorry stanford business prof called the no asshole rule and he actually did a financial breakdown of what happens when you don't pull the ladder up and in the way it kind of i mean i think of the way it hurts everybody but you know, because he's business, he looked at the way it financially destroyed everyone. And that has been a guiding force. But I, and it's fun to say asshole out loud, but I love the beautiful kind of image because that's exactly the situation we found ourselves in. And we just went like kind of laid down the law. And, you know, 
the rule is everybody gets to be an asshole sometimes. Like you don't like, well, not angels, but, but that kind of uh, pretentiousness around art, we're like, that's not what we're doing. You know, like, yeah, we want to make beautiful art, but it's okay if we don't too. It's okay if we make average art and we're doing healing too. That's okay. That counts. We don't want to like have somebody come and tell us how they're better than us. And we're not interested in that. Sometimes it's just community and sometimes we just need that. It's, it's a sense of belonging. It's a place. And, you know, I do say out of the pandemic came a time where people were more pensive about the environment. What I'm noticing is that it's, it's more on the radar because it sustains us. Art sustains us, but all education is environmental education. I mean, David Orr told us this and we know this. So I'm not sure how do you explore the environment without the arts? It's a, it's a feeling that it's, it's there. So for me, a lot of that came out. And of course, in Canada, we're doing reconciliation and it's very important with, you know, our indigenous peoples. And so that plays a part of all of the work and the activism and trying to do the good work, but sometimes it's just coming and sitting and being with your peeps and having coffee. And maybe I didn't do art that day, but it's in my head. And, or, you know, I, however we get to those places, but yeah, we need to make spaces for it. And I hope that, um, I hope people feel that they can do that work where the, wherever they are. It's, it's really important. So, yeah. Thanks so much. This is like so, oh, so generative. So many other questions, but I'm gonna. I'm wary of time, and I'm gonna pass it back to you, I'm, I'm Rita. Oh. Thank you, Noala, and thank you, Jessica. Uh, I just wanted to do a short vote of thanks, uh, uh, especially for for all of you who are here now and the people who will be joining us in the next panels. Uh, I want. I'm very grateful to Niche for. Uh, you know, allowing me to do something. You know, we we always think of environmental history as something very archive driven. You know, to have me and allow me the space to bring these conversations together. As you know, Nick was saying, you find uh, like minded people, you take them to the treehouse, and then then you pull the ladder. That is what I'm trying to do here. That is what I even put on the chat box. And I'm really grateful to have uh, met you people, to have read your work, to be collaborating at the moment, and also looking forward to opportunities of collaboration between all amongst you know amongst all of us that are here in the future. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having the faith and thank you so much for the good work that we all are doing. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, you want to say something and then we break from the panel?